many times in the lap part of the course, we will filter our precipitate and we will weigh it. And we will use not filter paper and a funnel, but we'll use what's called a fritted glass funnel or a gooch filter crucible, so-called because you can actually heat it to dryness before you use it in a filtering experiment. And so we checked in with four of these into our glassware. It looks something like this. We typically hook it up to a vacuum source to allow the liquid to be pulled through the crucible and down to the bottom, leaving behind a precipitate on here. And of course, if we weigh it empty and dry, and then we weigh it full of precipitate, we can then just subtract the two masses from each other to find the mass of the precipitate itself. In order to dry and weigh our samples in the lab, it's common to place them in a previously weighed weighing bottle. And a weighing bottle is simply a glass vial that has a tight fitting lid on it. We can dry our sample in a weighing bottle by placing it inside of a beaker. Here's the weighing bottle with the substance we want to dry in and here's a lid. We can place a watch glass over the surface of the beaker just to prevent any dust from coming in and we can place it in an oven. In order to dry we typically just have to heat it up past the point at which water boils and if we heat it above about 110 degrees C or so, that's typically all that we need to dry our samples. Although some samples will retain water and need to be heated to a higher temperature. But we have to be cautious because samples can degrade if they're placed in too high of a temperature. So once it has been dried, it then needs to cool down. Now we could just take everything out and put it on the countertop, but one problem is that moisture can condense upon the surfaces, and as it cools, it can actually increase in weight and actually retain a little bit of water. So what we normally do is this. We use a piece of glassware called a desiccator. There's actually two different desiccators here. This is a vacuum desiccator, and this is a regular desiccator. And so in our lab, we'll use regular desiccators. So what we need to do is we need to put our sample inside that is still warm, and the bottom of the desiccator will be filled with what we call desiccant. And so this is a material that is capable of absorbing water from the sample and keeping it dry. So water can come down here and irreversibly bind with it. This whole thing is sealed, so typically we use a glass lid and we use a thin layer of grease just to kind of keep the air out. And so as the sample cools down, any water is absorbed by the desiccator when the lid is open temporarily, so things stay dry. The difference with a vacuum desiccator is that we actually remove the air using a vacuum pump and then as we turn this top thing around, the little air hose can actually close and maintain a vacuum inside that helps to pull water from our sample. And again, we've got desiccant in the bottom to absorb and irreversibly bind with any of the water that comes off. The only problem with a vacuum desiccator is that when we open it up, we can't open it up without releasing the vacuum. And so we basically turn this top valve in the opposite direction. Air will rush in. We have to be a little bit careful as the air rushes in, it can disturb the surface of our sample. So we normally want to make sure our sample is covered up with a glass watch glass or in the case of a weighing bottle, we just put the lid on slightly ajar. Desiccants, there are multiple different kinds. And so this table is from our textbook and it just lets us know essentially how efficient the desiccant is. We will typically use dryrite, which is anhydrous calcium sulfate, with an indicating compound of cobalt 2 chloride in, which is blue when dry and pink when wet. This is the amount of water left in the atmosphere, so essentially the higher this number is, the more humid the air inside the desiccator will be, the less dry it potentially will be. So calcium sulfate and silica gel are not extremely good desiccants, but they're very cheap and they remove the majority of water left in the sample. But if we wanted to reduce the water level to a very small amount, we'd have to use a more aggressive desiccant. So for instance, phosphorus pentoxide would reduce the humidity in the air down to 3.6 micrograms per liter and all the way down to something like anhydrous magnesium perchlorate, which would reduce it to a very low level. These compounds are typically more difficult to work with, although if you need your sample dry, of course you have to go there.